Hi everyone, welcome to today's session. Today's session is on men's health. It is Men's Health Awareness Week coming up. So we thought we would prepare this fantastic session for you on men's health awareness. Now I'm going to share my screen right now and we will get right into it. Okay, so Men's Health Awareness, thank you all for tuning in and listening to this video. My name is Josh Lambert, I'm from Pinnacle Health Group. So we are to get cracking straight away. We are a workplace wellness organisation. So we work directly with a range of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we design wellbeing programs. We run various health and wellbeing initiatives for workplaces like flu vaccinations and health checks and skin cancer checks. And we run a whole range of workshops similar to this one that are all around inspiring healthy changes for employers. And our real belief is that wellbeing is really shaped or our wellbeing behaviours are shaped in the workplace or where we work and the work that we do directly impacts our wellbeing. And that it does have that knock on effect, not only to employees, but to the families and the communities that we all interact with as well. So really excited to be talking to you all today. Now, the topic is on men's health. So what we're going to be doing, first of all, is sort of defining what is wellbeing or what is health and wellbeing? Because before we get into what is men's health, we really need to take a little bit of a step back first. Um, we're also going to cover up on some of the imbalances or some of the difference between men's and women's health in Australia um, in particular. So there are obviously various uh, health and wellbeing risks that, that both genders have. There are various uh, checks that we all need to be getting, both with ourselves and doing some self-checks and also with a doctor. And we'll go through that today for you and, and really outline some of the key things that you need to look at. The other thing that we'll go through is we'll be providing three simple tips to improve your health. Now, the first few slides of this session are all about what is wellbeing, and you'll find out that it is quite multifaceted in nature. But what we'll do is we'll really simplify and go bang for your buck. What are three things that you can do from today to really improve your overall health? And three simple tips to go through there. And then we'll round it out and summarise. And obviously, given that this is a pre-recorded session, uh, we, will, we won't be um, answering any questions at all. Uh, but what we, what we can do um, is we can send you along a fact sheet to have a look at as well after the conclusion of this session. So let's get into it. So now, a bit of background. I'm a physiotherapist by background. And when I came through the university system, certainly the way I learnt health, was very much centred around physical health. It was the biomedical approach to, to wellbeing, which was very much, if you had anything wrong with you, it was really seen as that being healthy is the absence of sickness or disease, basically. So um, we now fast track, I won't show my age too much, but fast track to where we are today. We certainly know that wellbeing is much more than just being absent of being sick or, or uh, unhealthy there or, or the risk of death or disease. So what, what we do know is that wellbeing is that Nice interaction, as the slide here shows, between mental well-being, social well-being, and physical well-being. So, and again, these all are interrelated very, very closely. We can all probably think of a circumstance where one of those well-being aspects was impacted in some way, and it having in, indirect or direct effects on those other well-being pillars there. So, for example, the classic one is if we are feeling unwell or we have a physical injury. So recently, this is, this is an actual story, but I hadn't been running much. Uh, this was actually around, centred around the lockdowns that we're going through in this, in this COVID-affected uh, time that we're in now. And because the gyms had closed, I actually went out and went for a fair few runs in close succession, which is pretty bad as a physiotherapist, obviously. Um, what that then led to was me having some Achilles pain and some calf discomfort. And that obviously impacted my physical well-being. Now, it indirectly or, or fairly much directly impacted my mental well-being because exercise for me is very much a way to, to feel release and to, to feel better about myself. And it also directly affected my social well-being because it meant that I wasn't interacting, again, part of this lockdown, wasn't interacting as well socially with family and, and friends and work colleagues and so on because I don't have that outlet, don't have that release. So that's a really simple example. I'm sure you could think of an example yourself where either your physical, mental or social wellbeing has been impacted and having an effect around the other way. Now, what does all of that mean for men and women? So 
both men and women, as I alluded to at the start of this session, there are different risk profiles. So there's that classic sort of, you know, men are, I, I, won't, I won't go into all the, the real old school part of it, but women live longer. And that is absolutely true. So the, the, um, as we stand here in 2021, uh, the life expectancy of women is 85 and the life expectancy of men in Australia is 80.9. So there's, there's a fair difference there. Um, that does change. So for Indigenous males and females, there's about eight to nine years less, respectively, for men and women. Um, but certainly for the Australian population, women are living longer in that life expectancy. But there are some other risks to men's health that are more prevalent to men than there are to women. Now, men are more likely to get sick from serious health problems from women. Okay, so that means more things like cancer. It means more, as the next point there outlines, more non-gender specific health problems. So obviously, you know, cervical cancer, breast cancer and so on are much higher in, in females for obvious reasons. But anything that's non-gender specific, unfortunately, men die in greater numbers than, than females. Uh, and as it says at the start, they're more likely to get sick from serious health problems. Men are also, on average, and this is from all the ABS statistics, are less inclined than women to take an active role in maintaining their health. So that means that, again, th there are huge stereotypes happening here for, in order to deliver this presentation. But what we really need to, to make sure of is that those generalisations are using statistics. But what is, is absolutely you know, factual through those statistics is that men aren't getting out there as much and seeking advice actively uh, engaging in activities that improve their well-being on average as women are. So that's really something to, to take into account. Now, the suicide rate, unfortunately, that up to 75% of the suicide rate is, is males. So that's a huge, significant change there. So that's one of the largest differences between men and women there that, that really, really needs to be changed. And there are a lot of a lot of um, organisations and a lot of resources available that, again, will follow this, this workshop um, with resources to do with men's mental health. And, and you know, that's, that's really, really huge. And the final point we're to make between, between men's and women's health is that men are shown that we visit the doctor less frequently. Uh, when we do go to the doctor, it's for shorter visits. And when we do go, it's only really to attend when the illness is at a point where it's either in its late stage or it's it's really having an effect on lifestyle. So, again, it's not painting a fantastic picture, but it's really pointing out on average, again, without stereotyping too much, it's pointing out that on average these are the main differences between men's and women's health. Now, if you flip that and you look at women's health as opposed to men's health, women are more likely to suffer from an anxiety disorder across their lifetime. Um, there are... A lot of other risks associated with being a female than there are male, higher rates of domestic violence or being affected with those type of behaviours. So, but what we're dealing with right now is men's health and certainly there are some areas there that um, perhaps we could all, all have a think about of, you know, we may know men that have been affected or we might be directly affected ourselves. So one of the first things I want to talk to you about today in men's health and part of the awareness is actually doing something about it. We want to make this session really practical and have some, some really sort of simple take-home messages and take-home actions that we can all take today. So one of the first things is really the best place to start is, well, what do we need to check? What, what is, we spoke earlier on what is wellbeing and what is health, but how do we check up on that? And, and you know, if we're not, as it said in the previous slide, if we're not going to see a doctor as much or we're not men in general, um, playing such an active role in our own health and well-being, what we need to really make sure of that we know what we're looking for and we know what to check because the last thing we want is something to, to pop up and we haven't been able to identify that or we haven't been for our regular checkup with the doctor. So first thing I would say is that obviously self-checks are great, but they don't replace going to the doctor. So men in general, we do need to get over that, again, generalising, but we do need to get over that fear of it's being a sign of weakness or it's being stoic or you just put up with it. And we certainly need to get to a doctor and get regular checkups. But there are some things that we all need to self-check. So looking at it yourself and monitoring it for any changes. So we've summarised this into four categories here. And the four areas are testicles, skin, teeth and diet and exercise or more that lifestyle factor. So the first one is that checking your testicles. Now, basically from puberty onwards, it is really important that we're constantly checking, not constantly, but 
very frequently checking our testicles for any thickenings in the tissue, any lumps that we detect in our, in our testes. Uh, basically, that is because we want to make sure that there's no cysts developing, there's no test, uh, no cancer or any anything along those lines that may prompt us going to the doctor. So what we need to do if we find any lumps, any thickenings that we report straight to the doctor and, and get that assessed properly. So that's something that, that you can be doing regularly. The other, the other one is your skin. And, and this, this, of course, is not gender specific, but it is something that men, we all need to have a look at. Now, two out of three Australians and New Zealanders, unfortunately, will be diagnosed, by, diagnosed with skin cancer, sorry, by the age of 70. So I'll say that again, in Australia and New Zealand, Unfortunately, two out of three of us will be diagnosed with skin cancer by the age of 70. So that is huge. Checking our skin and checking any spots in our skin for discoloration, changing in size, if it's changing texture, if it's if it's developed a lump and so on, they're the sorts of things that we want to check regularly. And again, if we're noticing anything abnormal, we want to be going straight to the doctor. Now, one thing that we do at Pinnacle Health Group, we do a lot of workplace skin cancer checks. Um, so it is something that we really recommend the average person in Australia and New Zealand to be having a skin cancer check at least annually. Um, and that takes 15 minutes. It's a head to toe skin cancer check. And it's really, it's a, a dermatoscopist, which is basically a nurse with a skin cancer qualification, looking at every spot on your body and making sure that it hasn't, you know, it's something that doesn't need to be taken out or it's not suspicious. And if it is, it's a referral to the GP to have a look at and, and potentially remove that. So that's one to be really careful, careful of given the high skin cancer rates in Australia and New Zealand. Now, teeth. Now, it is shown. So if we have poor dental health, that has huge effects on our cardiovascular health on our overall well-being. So checking your teeth all the time for gum disease, for any cavities, for any anything you'll notice with your teeth and making sure we're keeping up our dental hygiene regularly. So brushing our teeth at least twice a day, flossing, all the stuff that the dentist, I know it sounds like it's being a, uh, being a school teacher here, but all of those things have huge implications on our overall health and wellbeing. So regularly checking our teeth, having a bit of a look, and if, if you are feeling some discomfort, not putting your head in the sand and thinking, oh, it might go away at some point in time. It's, if it does feel like it's something there, getting in to see the dentist and getting that checked. And the final thing, diet and exercise, they're, they're very closely linked but making sure we're maintaining, we actually have, when we get to the tip section in today's session, we actually have a bit of information around um, some simple hacks that you can look at to improve your own diet and looking at the amount of fruit and vegetables that we really need and the amount of water that we should be consuming on, on the daily. So we'll talk about that in a moment. The same thing with exercise. So really, we all need to exercise. We'll talk about some hacks to improve our overall level of exercise, but they're the sorts of things we should be checking regularly. So if we know that our diet's been a bit rubbish, you can speak to a dietitian, you can go to your GP and you can even be put on a healthcare plan to see a, to see a dietitian, to potentially see any other health, health practitioner um, on any of those sort of issues that, that you've, you've um, detected there through self-check. So, um, and exercise as well, absolutely the same. If you know that you haven't been able to get out for exercise and it's starting to impact your physical, social or mental wellbeing, it's certainly something to look at there. Now, they're the self-checks. The other checks we spoke about are obviously getting in to see your doctor and getting the more official and, for, and formal checks done. So heart health checks are super important. So that can range from doing blood glucose tests to simply checking blood pressure and heart rate and so on with your doctor. But there's also some fantastic uh, tools available. There's the heart age calculator online, which is from the Heart Foundation in Australia. Um, and that can actually give you, you fill out a few different questions and that gives you a heart health age. Um, and that's a really important thing to do as well. But that's something that your, your GP will, will be able to go through with you as well. Um, prostate cancer checks. Now, prostate cancer checks, basically, if you're age between 50 and 70, you should be getting these done every year, if not every second year, okay? And that's where the GP will check for any signs of prostate cancer. There are some specific tests that they go through, but it's certainly something if you're age between 50 and 74 or you have a family history of prostate cancer. Um, it's something that you want to be getting checked regularly. And, and your GP will certainly inform you of, of how regularly you need to come back and so on. But you can see where this is all headed. It's all coming back to having regular catch-ups. And there's nothing wrong with going to the doctor, having a catch-up and being told you've got a really clean bill of health and you're, you're good to go. Because that doesn't mean 
cool, come back when you're feeling something, you know, in feeling something sore in pain or or you've got something going wrong, it means it's better, prevention is better than cure as we know, and it's better to stay on top of these things. And finally, bowel cancer. So absolutely the same as above. If you've got a family history or if you're aged between 50 and 74, at least every second year you need to be checking with your GP about that. So um, obviously that that goes through using a stool sample. Now there are um, stool sample kits, so self-kits that can be sent out. So I think once you turn 50 in Australia, they do send you out um, a kit in the mail and you basically take your own sample and you send that off to a pathology lab um, and can go through it that way. So it's really convenient and it's something just to stay on top of as well. So there your regular health checks that are, as a male, you want to be checking regularly both in a self-check and with a GP. Now, what we haven't touched on here is mental health. Now, it probably goes without saying, we spoke before about the physical, social and mental wellbeing integration, but it probably goes without saying, but I need to make a point here that if you are, of course, feeling overwhelmed, feeling like your mental well-being is being affected in any way, of course, presenting to your doctor, speaking to Lifeline, speaking to Beyond Blue, there's the Movember Foundation, there's some fantastic resources available for any men or women that are going through some mental health concerns. So please reach out if that is the case as well. And that's something that, even though it's not mentioned here, checking in with your own mental health regularly and checking in with mates as well and, and making sure that uh, everything is going all right in that sense. Okay, now that that has gone through sort of the things that we need to look at. Now, before we treat, we, we need to assess. I'm putting my physio hat on here, but before we provide suggestions and uh, give advice on our own health and wellbeing, we first need to stop and check and see where we're at. And that, that first part of the session there has been on self-checks and checks with the doctor. So, if you take nothing else home from today, it is that there are things that you need to check regularly with yourself and also with the doctor. Now, this part of the session, I want to go through three very, very simple tips for any men out there uh, that basically can apply. It's men and women, by the way, but any tips to improve your overall well-being. We saw the, the main uh, aspects of our health and well-being that we need to assess. These are three take-homes that you can apply as of today and start to apply them to your life to improve your overall health and well-being. So the first one we're going to talk about is nutrition or fuel. And as the cheesy uh, meme says here, me after eating one piece of broccoli, I'm sure we've all done this before where we, we say, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really good here. I'm going to do clean eating, hashtag clean eating, or I'm going to really start to focus on my own health and well-being by eating well. And we do it really beautifully, and then we sort of fall off the bandwagon there. So the reason I wanted to show this slide is that healthy nutrition and this is one of the hottest topics that we speak about as a workplace wellness provider, but we've all probably been there where the classic sort of, you know, five a day and, you know, make sure you're eating a, eating in moderation and, and all those sorts of things. Sometimes we can, I shouldn't say, but we can get a little bit bored of those sorts of things and we shouldn't be because that is uh, basically the only approved advice from the Diet Dietitians Association of Australia and the RACGP, but basically that's the only advice that rings true for all of us is that we need to make sure we're eating healthy whole grains, make sure we're eating a healthy amount of fruit and vegetables in our diet and we're drinking plenty of water. So it sounds simple. For some people it gets boring, but it is the thing to focus on. So I wanted to show you this because it, these flash in the pan, sort of, uh, you know, paleo, keto, these sorts of things, they do work for certain people. Uh, intermittent fasting is another one that comes up quite a lot and they can work for the right person. But all of them are based around actually the same principles, which are eating whole grains, having really you know, good amounts of, of portion control. So making sure our plate is predominantly vegetables with smaller amounts of protein and smaller amounts of carbohydrates. But basically what I wanted to do is go through a little bit of a, a Q and A with you guys here. Now, obviously this is a pre-recorded session, but I'm going to go through three really simple questions on those key parts of nutrition I spoke about before. The first question is I'm going to ask how many serves of fruit per day are recommended for the ADAA recommendations? And I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that, but the correct answer is C2. So two serves of fruit per day is the correct answer. Um, certainly I know, you know, through some confusion and so on, we, we do get a lot of people thinking that they should be eating more serves of fruit per day. It's not terrible if you do eat more than two serves of fruit per day depending on a lot of other aspects of your own diet, but two serves of fruit per day are recommended. So that is one serve of fruit, just to note, is either one large piece of fruit, like an apple or a pear or someone, 
or a cup full of smaller uh, fruit. So whether that's berries, um, you know, other grapes, etc. That's question one. Question two, how many serves of vegetables per day? A, five, B, four, or C, two? Now, the correct answer to that is A, five. Now, this one for me, I'm not sure about yourself, but five serves of vegetables at times of various periods in my life, I've found this quite difficult to get five serves of vegetables in. And again, that is a cup full of either uncooked or cooked vegetables per day. Now, some hacks to improve your intake, particularly of vegetables um, or fruit for that matter, is to really prepare snacks. So you can see the hack that I've mentioned down there is snack preparation. So things like preparing carrot sticks, um, whether you're taking those into work or you've got them handy at home. Um, it might be things like cutting up cucumber and having that that's really handy or having avocado that's really easy just to spread onto some rice crackers and so on. But snack preparation is the best way to get this in because what invariably happens if we're busy, sometimes the last thing we reach to is something that takes time to prepare and that can often be vegetables and fruit. So if we prepare them firstly, we're much more likely to go and grab it and it's straight in and we're not thinking straight to the fast food or the unhealthy alternative. So that's that's a bit of a hack there. And the third question is how much water per day should we be consuming? And the correct answer to that is B, one litre per 22 kilograms of body weight. So let's keep this really simple and say if, that, if the person was 88 kilograms in weight, they would need to be drinking four litres of water per day to be meeting the recommended uh, intake guidelines. So you can see that's quite a lot, okay? So, you know, you're talking, what's that for? That's really 16 cups of water per day if you weigh 88 kilograms. So, um, look, some hacks to increase your water intake is obviously to have a drink bottle handy nearby wherever you're working or wherever you might be preparing food or doing anything like that for a sustained period of time. Um, but we really need to be, if there's one thing you can take out of anything today that improves so much of our well-being, it is that drinking more water improves, obviously it improves our hydration. That's a fairly obvious thing to say. It improves our weight loss. It improves our mental state. It's been shown to improve our sleep. It's been shown to improve so many parts of our health and well-being. So there's nothing else that you can take home. It would be drinking more water there. And one litre per 22 kilograms body weight gives you a nice ballpark amount. Second tip, and it's also a hot topic with everyone that we speak to, is sleep health and improving our sleep. Now, there are those people that, um, you know, I'm sure we all know them that sort of say, oh, I don't, you know, I'm one of those people that don't need seven hours per night sleep. I'm fine on four hours sleep and I can function okay. That is a myth. So those people, even though they might be able to do that, it's still having an impact probably an indirect impact on a lot of aspects of their well-being as well. So it can affect. So again, we spoke about poor hydration, poor sleep health increases weight gain. It decreases mental well-being. It can increase anxiety. It, um, it also can affect social relationships and all those other parts of well-being that we spoke about before. But it has been proven that really minimum seven hours per night are the recommended guidelines for us. Now, Having said that, there will be nights where you don't get anywhere near seven hours, and that is okay, but that's that's our target, and it doesn't mean if you don't achieve them that suddenly your health and well-being is just gone, you know, you've lost it, but it does mean that that is what you should be aiming for, and we should be basing our target sleep amount around that. So if you know you're going to bed, you know, the simplest thing to do is if you know you're going, you, you go to bedtime is around about midnight, okay, that's quite late, you've really got to be sleeping past 7 a.m. in the morning to, to really get that amount of sleep. So if you know you're not going to be able to get in past 7 a.m., you've got children, you've got a dog that might wake you up or you like to get up early and exercise, you know that you've got to be going to bed early. So it's a very obvious thing to say, but it, it is worth saying. The other things you need to consider with your sleep health are things like the time that you eat and the amount of caffeine that you consume and also using electronic devices and the lighting. So first of all, with dinner, it's been strongly recommended that we have our main meal. If dinner's the main meal, that we have that at least two hours before bedtime. Okay, if we eat a large meal and it's too close to the time that we go to sleep, it's taking away from our rest uh, processes and our um, there's a hormone called melatonin in our body that actually increases our sleepiness. So if we've got this big meal that our body's digesting, it's not focusing on increasing our melatonin and therefore it's not improving our getting off to sleep ability effectively. So the other 
thing to add to that is caffeine. So caffeine is a stimulant, okay? Caffeine has a six-hour half-life. So what that means is that it takes six hours for, oh, sorry, in six hours, half of the caffeine that you've consumed is still in your body, six hours after you've consumed it. And then another six hours after that, so 12 hours after you've drunk that coffee, that or, or taken whatever it is that the caffeine has come through, there's still a quarter of the amount of caffeine in there. So you need to consider that in the timing of your caffeine in, intake and the quantity that you're taking. So it means that if you're having coffee later in the day, it, there's a very fair chance that you're going to have some amount of caffeine in your system. Now, there are some people they can have an espresso after dinner and they're absolutely fine. Um, there are some people that if they did that, they'd be up all night and they'd be hating life. So you know yourself quite well that caffeine in, intake will certainly impact that. And the last thing that I want to speak about and also link that a bit to lighting are electronic devices. Now, light, the type of light, whether it's a warm light like an orangey or a red light versus basically an intense light, a blue light, a white light that's more in, on the intense spectrum, the more intense lighting actually uh, inhibits the formation of melatonin, that sleep hormone that I spoke about before. So warmer lights improve that. So if we think about the sleep-wake cycle in our normal daily life, basically the sun comes up, therefore it gets lighter. That stimulates us to effectively start to wake up and we're not as sleepy. As, it get, as the day progresses and it gets darker, we do become sleepier. That's just the natural sleep-wake cycle. So less light equals increased melatonin, equals equals increase, increased sorry, ability to get to sleep. Now, the electronic devices that we use, this is a massive, massive thing at the moment, are that iPhones, uh, you know, smartphones, tablets, laptops, etc. The light that they emit is the blue light I spoke about before. So that is actually a melatonin inhibitor. Therefore, it reduces the sleep hormone, reduces our sleepiness, makes it harder for us to get to sleep. So, you know, if we're all like the image here, like Michael Jordan, we're looking at our phone and we're reading something or we're, you know, doom scrolling through Instagram when we're in bed, effectively what that can do is that could actually inhibit the melatonin um, creation and therefore decrease our chance of getting off to sleep nicely. So ideally we wouldn't be having our electronic devices in bed at all and one of the simplest hacks for that is actually getting a, an external alarm clock, like an old school alarm clock, and pop it in your bedroom and leaving your phone out of the bedroom. That isn't often practical for many people. So one thing you can do, there's a bit of a hack, is that your phones have effectively a mood lighting or they have a, um, it's a sleep mode, basically. And what it does is it has more of an amber overlay and therefore you can still be looking at your phone. It's a warmer light and it's less of a, inhibitor of melatonin and therefore allows you to get to sleep a little bit easier. The other thing you can do is you can actually gradually reduce the lighting in your living room or in the rooms that you're in before you go to bed. So, you know, two hours, three hours before bedtime, you can start to dim the lights or start to turn some lights off in other areas. So it's not from stark bright light to darkness and then you're staring at the ceiling. Okay. And finally, just to bring us home, I want to speak about movement. So Exercise and movement is super, super important. We spoke before about having that as a regular self-check and something to check in with the GP, of course. You should be looking at 60 minutes of exercise per day, and that's including exercise that we're purposefully doing and also incidental exercise. That might be walking to pick, pick up your children from school or, or the commute or riding to work or walking to the bus stop, whatever it might be. Um, but we know that movement and exercise has direct links to our mental well-being and our social well-being. So it's super, super important to keep our bones strong, to keep our muscles active, uh, to improve our posture, but it's also critically important, not just for those physical elements, but to improve our mental and social well-being as well. And a bit of a hack there is to increase our incidental exercise. A lot of us have been, you know, with all the different COVID changes, have been working from home uh, at various times and incidental exercise is something that has dropped away significantly. So, for any of you guys out there that are thinking, all right, I, I want to exercise more, I just don't, you know, I've got kids I'm juggling, I've all these commitments, incorporating exercise into either your work day or getting to work or getting to where it is that you need to go is a really nice way to, to, um, to factor that in. So, you know, think really simple things like taking the stairs instead of the lift, uh, walking to the shops instead of driving two minutes in the car, stuff like that is really, really important. So, that effectively concludes the session for today on men's health awareness. 
what I really want to make sure of is that if anyone is experiencing any um, concerns with their overall health and wellbeing, that you get in to see your GP or, as I mentioned before, there are various resources available through Movember Foundation, Beyond Blue and Lifeline if you're experiencing any mental health concerns. But wish you all a really, really happy and healthy Men's Health Week. And if you'd like to get in touch um, about anything at all, you're welcome to contact us at pinnaclehealthgroup.com.au. Thank you so much for listening.